just starting up the recorder. And um, has anyone checked out the uh, recording on YouTube? Nobody has found it. Okay, how is it working out okay? Yeah, it, it works fine. Okay, all right. Um, sometimes when I walk around too much, you know, the microphone you know, may not pick me up as well you know, as I walk a little bit too far away from it. Um, I tried the cordless mic already. Um, they work okay, but because it's digital, they compress a lot. And uh, the voice quality is really poor. Yeah, it, it uh, was a bit fuzzy. Sorry? It, it did get a bit fuzzy from time to time. On the voice? Yeah. With this? Oh, yeah. Huh. But not that fuzzy, though. Okay, but it's still okay. We can still understand what I'm talking about. Okay, all right. Um, so I'm going to get started with the class. <coughs> um, let's see. Log in already. Right, let's go to the class. All right. Okay, so let's talk about your first homework assignment. You know, you got one homework assignment already, and I know there are people who are trying to add to the class. Um, what I'll do is I'll have you guys to send me an email if you're on waitlist or trying to add to the class. I can add you into Moodle, but not onto the roster. Okay, so you can at least do the homework assignments and have access to the course content. Um, but you won't be officially on roster until there's room in class, so I can add you guys, you know, in one by one. Is that okay? Does everybody, does everybody understand what I'm talking about? So I will still pass the row sheet around, so this way I can, you know, basically identify, you know, who's in class and who's not in class, um, and try to move people into the roster as quickly as I can. Um, so if you want to add to the class, you know, send an email to me, and you know, use my email address that I talked about in the syllabus. It's drtak2013 fall at gmail.com. And you probably want to include um, the section number because I'm teaching two sections of CISP 300. So if you don't, if you don't tell me which section, then I may not, I do not know which section you want to add, which section you want me to add you into. So you can just tell me that you want to add to CISP 300, and this is the AM, the morning section, because the other one is the night section. So if you just mention AM, then I know which section you're talking about. <coughs> um, and make sure you include your seven-digit student ID. That's the that's one part that I really need in order to add you to the system. First name, last name are also needed needed in order to create your account. All right. Are there any <coughs> questions about you know what you have to do to in order to get you get yourself into Moodle if you're not already enrolled in the class? If you're already enrolled, there's no problem. I mean, you're you're all set already. Okay, any questions, no questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I'm going to move uh, forward a little bit. Um, I think there are about, I would say about 10 people or so who are in, you know, in the class already, enrolled, and they have not logged into Moodle yet, okay? I know we're only about you know, two days into this class because the class started on Tuesday, but you might want to log in as soon as you as soon as possible and uh, participate <coughs> or finish the syllabus acknowledgement you know, activity um, so you can actually get started with the homework assignments. All right. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to show you the homework assignment. <coughs> and you can only get to the homework assignment after you acknowledge um, regarding the syllabus. Um, for this homework assignment, it is a really a setup, you know, assignment for the rest of the semester for this class. Um, in this class, I require everybody to use LibreOffice or OpenOffice if you have an older installation, that's okay too. But it has to be OpenOffice or LibreOffice, not Microsoft Office, to do the homework assignments. Okay, because you know when I grade, I'm going to use LibreOffice to grade your homework assignment, and there are certain things that are not compatible between the two Office suites. You said it's just an older version of OpenOffice. Well, OpenOffice is the older yeah. you know, name of it. Oh. So if you that's already have one installed, no, you know I don't need you to reinstall or update it. Um, if you don't have it installed, you, when you install it, it's going to be LibreOffice. That's what it's called. Yeah, okay. it's that, that's what it's called now because. After Oracle bought Sun, 
um, the entire team who was responsible for open office left. <coughs> <coughs> they did not like the new management. They just they just left, and so they left and became a liberal office. Yep. I wish my sequel, you know, has the same uh, fate, but no. <laughs> <laughs> or Java, for that matter. <coughs> All right, so there are two ways to install uh, LibreOffice. Actually, there are quite a few more, but th these are the two most common ways to install LibreOffice. The first way is easy. You go to LibreOffice.org, and it looks like this. Uh, LibreOffice is already up to version 4.1, um, but the nice thing about LibreOffice and OpenOffice is they keep the same user interface across all their versions. Um, I started off with uh, OpenOffice 1.1 or 1.0, um, and you know the the look and feel remain pretty much the same. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you know how to install you know software already, but I'll just kind of go through the process um, really quickly. And you just click you know download LibreOffice now. <coughs> And it automatically identifies which operating system you you are running. Um, in my case, you know I am using Linux, so it tells me that it, you know, it's trying to it will try to install LibreOffice for Linux. If you're using Windows, it will automatically identify that you're using Windows, and as a result, it will give you the correct you know set of files, the, the correct installation file. You can always go here and choose the operating system. And you know, just say that you know, okay, you know, even though I'm using Linux, I want to get the file that will install into Windows, and that works too. Um, let me see if there's a way to. Okay, if I click this, um, okay, there are two ways to install it. You can either uh, get the file by torrent, or you can just click on main installer, and that will download a 205 megabyte file. Um, so if you have a fast internet you know, connection, you know, it's not going to take a whole lot of time. On the other hand, if you have a slower you know, internet connection, that might take a little bit of time to download you know, 200 megabytes. You can do this and download the installation file in the lab. You can go to room 152, which is our main lab for the uh, BCS division, and just download it onto your thumb drive, and you know, take it home and, and, and then install it. Okay, so that way that can save you, you know, some bandwidth, you know, especially if you're on Comcast or some other um, ISP that limits you know, how much stuff you can download per month, then you don't have to use up your bandwidth for this purpose. They can watch more YouTube and Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> right? <coughs> All right. So is that okay? Does everybody understand how to install LibreOffice? Go ahead. I'm just curious. Um, I know because I know I, you know, I I've used LibreOffice before, but you know it doesn't work that well on my older machine. But I've got an older version of Word, and I just save an RTF so I can move it wherever I need to. Is there a okay. problem with doing that, or there is a problem with doing it because I want to keep track of um, the history of editing a document, okay. and that part doesn't work. You know when you use RTF because okay. for, well, the other thing is we don't use Word documents, we use Excel documents, you know, or spreadsheet documents. Um, in this class, you know, it'll, it'll be clear <coughs> when we get to you know the tracing of the algorithms. Okay. You know, we use you know basically spreadsheets you know, for doing that. Okay. Um, all right. So this is the first way, or one of the many ways to do it. Um, the other thing about LibreOffice is it is open source. Does anyone want to kind of tell the rest of the class you know, what open source means? There are several things, implications. Uh, the main thing you think of is it's free. Yep, it is free and free. Okay, the first free refers to free as in free beer. Okay, you know it's no charge to you. Actually, just a question: Is it on a new public license or GNU public license? Or? I think this is a GPL version two. Okay. So this is on a GNU public license version two, okay. and not version three. Version three is a little bit, you know, too much. You know, and a lot of vendors do not like to use yeah. a GPL version three. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is GPL version two. Um, <laughs> So it is free, as in uh, free beer, but it's also free, as in freedom, which means you can download the source code of LibreOffice. If you're just curious you know, how everything is done, you can just read through the source code. 
if you think that open office or library office you know has certain features that is qu not quite to the level that you like okay or you want to add new features to it you can make changes to the source code recompile the whole thing and then redistribute as your you know version so it is free as in freedom as well but as far as we are concerned in this class it is the free as in free beer that is important because you can download the installer and onto a thumb drive and they can just you know, install it on as many machines as you have access to. Okay, uh, if you don't like it, just go ahead and uninstall it. I mean, it's no big deal. Um, so, are there any questions about that that particular aspect of Open Office? I think after installation, it takes up um, maybe 500 megabytes or 700 megabytes or so, which is actually great. Which is a whole lot, you know, by old standards. By new standards, you know, you know, taking up you know several hundred megabytes doesn't seem to face a lot of people. Any questions? Yep, go ahead. Do you have any idea if they have something for a mobile version? Yes, they do. Yeah. Now, as in mobile, as in for phones or mobile, as in Android. for Android, I do <coughs> not think so. I don't think they have an Android version. It's still too heavyweight for mobile devices like that. So if you want to do on mobile devices, you might have some problems. <laughs> In fact, we can just look for it real quick and see whether they have it. LibreOffice Mobile. Well, that's it. <laughs> there you have it. You know, that's March 14th earlier this year. You know, it is frustratingly close to release. Um, now maybe it's released. Okay. Actually, it looks like it's released. It's already released? Yeah, it looks like it's an alpha. Yeah, like now available. Yeah, now available. Yeah. This one? Oh, oh no, sorry. Pre-alpha form, and that is in April. So that means, you know, maybe you can actually get to it on the Play Store, from yeah. the open office place. I don't know. You can do some research and see whether you can get it onto your uh, mobile device, uh, but I won't be responsible if you break it. <laughs> <laughs> you can like find it on hmm? the store? Uh, well, it's uh, not on Play. if it's on the Play Store, you should be able to just search for LibreOffice. Okay. If it's not on the Play Store yet, you'll have to download it as an APK file, and then you're going to have to enable developer options and then push the APK to your phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Just if you look up Android debugging bridge. <laughs> oh no, I don't have to do it. Okay. It might be quite uh, power hungry as well because it is a pretty big, you know, program. So if you even if they have an Android version, you know, that might be still be taking up a lot of juice to, to run it. Um, the chances of this being able to run on um, an iPod or an iPad is probably pretty slim, you know, because the two platforms are really quite different in terms of the programming language and the underlying stuff. So, um, and besides, Apple likes to control what apps are available and not available through their stores, unlike you know, Android, you know, which limits only to, I think they only take off stuff that are suspicious and folder. No, mm -hmm. it, it, it's malware. It's malware. But they don't, you know, limit it by content, you know, so, you know, the, the you know, LibreOffice would not be, you know, uh, censored, you know, through the uh, Android uh, Play Store. And with Android devices, you can always just get the APK file and install it through the APK file. But I don't think you can do it to an uh, iPad unless it is already uh, jailbreaked. Jailbroken. Um, okay, so the next best thing, if you want to be able to do your homework on you know different type, types of computers and be able to carry all, all of that stuff with you, is LibreOffice Portable. Um, this is a link to it. You, you can just go to portableapps.com and you know search and find it. Um, what this does is you can install it onto a USB thumb drive, um, and the application is entirely contained onto the thumb drive itself. So the nice thing about this is you can take that thumb drive and take it to any Windows machine, plug it in, and be able to run LibreOffice on that machine. Are you guys following what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you can go to the library, you know, with those machines, you know, they probably don't have LibreOffice installed. Um, as long as they have a USB, you know, port, you can plug in your portable hard drive, I mean, you can plug in your uh, thumb drive or external hard drive 
um, and double click on an icon and you know, start uh, LibreOffice on those machines. It does not require administrative rights to run the program, even though it's not installed on that machine. Okay, so that's really kind of nice because you know uh, it's not quite as good as running a mobile, you know, because it's not running on your cell phone or your tablet. But still, you know, as long as you have access to a Windows machine like the lab machines that we have here, you can still run you know, LibreOffice. Um, the other nice thing about this is it also saves the uh, preferences along with the application. So you know, you're taking all your preferences with you, so you don't have to worry about, oh, did I configure this installation the way TAC wants? Because I'll talk about that later. Um, because it's always with the application itself. For those of you who are curious, you can always go to the home page of Portable Apps and find out what other open source software um, is available in this particular format. Um, there are, there's a quite a bit of stuff you can do here. Um, you can, let me see, I haven't been here for a long time. <coughs> you can go to, well, I'm home already. They have a category you can actually, okay, there we go. So they have a directory, and you can see the type of software it has available. Uh, it certainly has some games, but I don't think you know these games are up to the same standard as your typical game that requires installation. Um, in terms of educational software, they have some really quite interesting ones. Um, Stellarium is one of my favorite, um, because I have a, a, a big telescope that I can use to you know, stargazing. And Stellarium turns your PC into a planetarium. Okay, um, so you can basically control the time and the location, and it will show you what you should see in the night sky, you know, in different directions. And you can overlay all that all of that stuff with constellations, names of planets, names of stars, nebulae, and so on and so forth. Really quite educational. I like it a lot. Um, but you can just kind of go through this and find you know, all sorts of different stuff you can install onto a thumb drive and be able to run the program you know, just on a thumb drive itself without having it to be installed permanently on a PC. All right. <clears throat> so are there any questions about step one? Either install it on a machine, quote unquote, permanently using the LibreOffice MSI file or you can go to portable apps and install it onto a thumb drive. If you run Ubuntu, uh, Debian, Linux, and stuff like that, it's just installing a package. You can install LibreOffice as a single package. Uh, it brings in all the other pack packages, but you know, it's pretty easy to do that. Um, are there any questions? So other than taking up maybe several hundreds of megabytes on your hard drive, it is free. There's no reason not to get it. <coughs> Step two. Now, step two is important, okay? Because I need to make sure that your installation of LibreOffice, or at least when you run it, it reflects your name as the author. Okay, so I can show you how to do that here because I have it already installed. You go to LibreOffice. Doesn't matter which application you use. You can just start with LibreOffice itself, which doesn't start an app. You go to Tools, and then you go to Options. And the first thing is what you need. LibreOffice user data. The only part I need you to enter would be your first name and last name. That's it. Okay, because once you enter your first name and last name as the user of this particular installation in this particular account, then every time you use this program later on, you know, if you use it to edit or create documents, that will be reflected <coughs> in the pro properties field of file. So if I go to Files and Properties, um, you can see that this file is created by me. Okay, so I will I will be looking for this in all of your documents when you, when you turn in homework assignments. So you got to make sure that you know whatever installation you use, you have to make sure that it contains this little piece of information. Are there any questions about this part? Okay, all right. So if there are no questions about this, I'm going to close the screen. So we are done with step two, and then we will proceed with step three. Step three is the actual homework assignment. Um, I chose a theme that you know, hides the hyperlinks, but the hyperlink is right here. 
So right click here and download a file. So I would just use the you know, safe link as the Google Chrome. Make sure you remember where you download the file. Okay. With Google Chrome, you don't have to because you can actually click here, but when you upload it, you still have to know where it is. So you then you know, open up the file, <coughs> and this is the file. Let me just zoom in a little bit. And all you have to do is to enter in column B, what is your first name, last name, and student ID. So I type that in. Sorry? I, that's too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now here is the most complicated step. Save it. <laughs> Go ahead. Roll call, thank you. <coughs> yeah, I used to actually do roll call and call the names, and then I found that one is taking up too much time in the class, and two, people do not like their first and or last name butchered. So, <laughs> <coughs> so I switched to this form instead. It's not as personal because I really don't get to know, you know people's name, you know, until the end of the semester. I still would not know the names of most people in class. But you know, it does save a lot of time, especially when the class size is like this. Okay. So the next step is complicated. Make sure you save the file before you perform the next step. So now that I have saved the file in here. Um, as, a, as an instructor, I cannot see it, but as a student, you will see a button at the bottom, and you, when you click it, it will say, okay, you can now upload the file. So you have to upload the file, make sure it is uploaded, and then you know, that's your homework assignment. Let me see if I can switch to a student role and be able to see it. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. There we go. So as a student, you know, you will see, you know, add submission, which is basically just the, uh, the ability to upload a file. So if I click this, it will present me with this screen here. I know it looks, it looks complicated, but that's, you know, really just an upload screen. Uh, you can drag and drop, or you can just, you know, click it, and then choose the file. I put mine into my downloads folder, and it's called LibreOffice, if I remember right. There we go. You open it, it's not done yet, okay? So don't say, oh, I'm all done, close the browser, turn off the machine, go to bed. Okay, make sure you click upload this file. And it'll just take a moment. All right, so now it's all done. Okay, we are all done, almost. You know, click save changes. So that becomes your submission for this particular homework assignment. <coughs> when you see this screen, then you're done, okay? Because this, this screen confirms that you have a file submission and it is this file. You can click this and then download the file back if you want to double check you know, whether it is, you know, it has a name on it or not. So you can always you know, download whatever file you upload to a homework assignment. Are there any questions about this? Yep, go ahead. Uh, is it right over with the most recent submission? Yes, it only keeps the latest submission, but you can resubmit as many times as you want before the due date. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Is there like a certain title that you want it to have, like homework nope. assignment? Nope, there's no, no need for any special title or file name. Yeah, because you know this is linked to your account, so when I grade it, I know who turned it in. Oh, okay. yeah. um, one more thing, it is the deadline. Um, this, you have one week, basically one week minus 20 minutes, 25 minutes to do it. Um, it's due next Thursday at 10 10 30 a.m., right before the class. <clears throat> I know, I'm, you know that it's not a whole lot of time for you guys to do this, but, because um, I know you guys, you will start at 10 25 <laughs> on that day. So five minutes is pushing it a little bit. So that's how you turn in your homework assignment. It's your first homework assignment. Um, and as far as grading is concerned, you must follow these steps exactly or else you may not receive any credit for this homework assignment. And in all future homework assignments, unless otherwise stated, you have to use LibreOffice or OpenOffice to edit the documents and your name must be reflected as the author of the document. So I'm setting up you know, the infrastructure that you will need for the rest of the semester. All right, so let me switch back to my 
normal roll and go back to developers and algorithms. Day and it's not working today. Let me just double check the settings and make sure I didn't mess up something here. Appearance, in frame. Um, for those of you who want to kind of go to YouTube and get some entertainment, um, you can actually go to YouTube. And Steve Ballmer, of all people, has a really interesting video clip that people have edited and enhanced and mess around that has to do with developers. <laughs> so you just have to go to YouTube, and then you just have to look up uh, Ballmer developers. See, that's the most popular one. Crazy is next to it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the search, you know, pop up or the hints, you know, reflect the popularity or frequency of search, you know, phrases. So you can see, you know, Balmer developers is the most frequently looked up item, and right next to it is Balmer crazy. <laughs> so um, yeah. So this one is kind of interesting because it 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 it, it kind of reflects, you know, how important developers are to any type of software company. And you know, to Microsoft, you know, developers are very important. And I think it's more, it's this is done, you know, because you know, I think Microsoft had a um, bad relationship with um, their VBA, you know, uh, Visual Basic for Applications uh, developers, because they, whenever Microsoft updates um, their ver Visual Basic um, version, it's always backward incompatible. <coughs> Okay, so the impact is if you spend a lot of time to develop, you know, an application using Visual Basic, when Microsoft updates Visual Basic to, to the next version, you have a lot of work to do to bring it up to the next version because it's not backward compatible. You cannot just use old programs using a new v, uh, VB uh, v Visual Basic platform. Um, so, but anyway, I think there's a lot, a little bit of background information about why you know he did what he did on stage, and uh, try to you know establish a good relationship with developers. <coughs> All right, so let's see where we were last time. Can anyone remember you know how much of this we went through last time? I think we kind of. Went the through this part here. Computing, software, administration, algorithms. Um, we were at the very end of two uh, computers and software. Okay. Processors were four, software was four. We specified logic and order and hardware and actions. All right, thank you. I should have watched my own class recording. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> okay, but you know, but the the point is, computers are everywhere. Okay, now. Just because computers are everywhere doesn't mean there will be a lot of jobs for developers, right? Because all computers can run basically the same operating system, the same applications, and, and we can limit you know, the number of applications to just a few, then there won't be a whole lot of jobs for developers. So why do you think there are a lot of jobs for developers now that we can find computers everywhere? Um, not only for your mobile devices, but also embedded applications like computers inside cars, inside you know other types of uh, you know machineries and you know, mechanisms. 
why do you think there, there, there will be an explosion of demands for developers? Customization. Customize, customization. But do you think all of those different installations of computers will run exactly the same programs? Oh, yeah. Nope. Okay. Let's we'll say languages. Languages. Or, or coding or pseudocodes. Pseudocodes. Different types of. Different types of applications require different programs. Yep. Go ahead. I was going to say when you buy like a computer game, you have to say whether you're getting it for your Windows or your Apple or if you're getting it on your mobile device. So they all have different. They're all slightly they different, but for the most part, you know, that's really just how the executable is done. Um, I would certainly hope that the source code, you know, would be about the same, even though it's you know intended for different platforms. Yep. Uh, more and more. In That certainly is one you know, reason why there will be more um, jobs for developers. But I'll just kind of throw this out and you know, let you guys think about it. Um, does, any, does anyone know what is Snap-on? Okay, it's a brand for tools, you know, professional tools for you know, mechanics. Okay, um, any of the thing, Snap-ons and software? Are you talking about the corporate software for managing payroll and stuff like that? No, well, they need that too. You know, any type of organization now, you know, need kind of payroll control and stuff like that. But I'm talking about a, a snap-on torque wrench. Yep. I currently have equipment, so you have automotive background. I understand um, a torque wrench is digital now. Yep. Um, we also have snap-on Lotus, which is an extremely powerful diagnostic piece of equipment, and then we also have the software that snap-on will sell. Mm -hmm. that you can run off of a laptop. Exactly. Okay. But a torque wrench, okay, you know, you look at a torque wrench, you go to Sears or you go to Harbor Freight, you look at a ten dollar torque wrench and go, you know, well, how does computer software has to do with this? Well, Snap on, you know, sells high end torque wrenches with you know digital, you know, it's digital. Okay, so it has a display. But you can easily you know see how you know once it is digital, you can add other capabilities to it. Okay, such as Bluetooth. Okay, so why would anyone want a Bluetooth enabled torque wrench? So it can tell you where it's at if you can't see it. Exactly, you can, it can tell you the torque amount, you know, you know, but you cannot actually see the torque wrench. You can record it. Mm -hmm. We currently have manufacturers that are interfacing the tools that the technicians are using with uh, workshop manual procedures. Yep. And if workshop manual procedures not followed correctly, it can identify whether the don't give uh, this guy a shot faster yeah. <laughs> 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 the previous repair was done correctly or not mm -hmm. um, based off of the information that was received from yeah. the individuals. Exactly. Yeah. Because if you use the wrong amount of torque, you know, bad things can happen. Um, if you use too little torque, not enough torque to you know torque your spark plugs, well, you know, guess what? It can come loose and you know, off goes your uh, you know spark plug. Not good. If you torque it too much, you can break it, which is also very messy. <laughs> Getting a broken uh, spark plug out of an engine block is messy. You can probably tell me how it's done. Is it messy? Kind of difficult? It depends on the vehicle, exactly. Some spark plugs are not accessible easily. <clears throat> All right. So, getting back to you know um, job opportunities. For developers, it's a lot more now than before. Okay, I would say ten years ago, you know, maybe the idea can, you know, maybe floating around, you know, putting you know a computer with programs running onto a torque wrench. Ten years ago, maybe people would be thinking about it. Maybe uh, you know, Snap On has an idea to do it, but the cost would be pro prohibitive. Okay, it would just be too costly to do it because they don't have the uh, the chips, you know, being inexpensive enough to do it. But these days, no problem. It's easy. Okay, you know the cost of hardware is no longer, you know, prohibitive to put a chip on just about anything. Okay, the cost is now mostly you know to develop and to maintain the software. That is you know the the, the cost of 
uh, doing software these days. It's no longer the, the hardware platform that is running the software. <clears throat> any other, any comments, questions about the, what I just said? No questions? Okay. Let me show you something else. Because I really want you guys to understand um, you know, where we're going and why I think you know, you know, software or developers is going to be you know, in a lot of demand. I just got my ID card you know, recently, and it looks just like a little piece of plastic with my, pictures, with my picture on it. But this one is actually chipped, okay? It's a chipped ID card. So that means, you know, in theory, they can install a RFID scanner at the door. So every time I walk in and walk out of the door, they can automatically know, okay, Tech walk into this classroom at this time and he walks out of the classroom at this time. Now, of course, you know, somebody will say, yeah, but just because, you know, they can scan my ID doesn't mean that they can tell whether I'm coming in or going out. Well, if they have two RFID scanners, then they can tell. Because now, you know, depending on the time difference between the two, you know, most of the time you can tell whether I'm going into the room or out of the room, okay? So that's software too, you know, and how to utilize that information is software as well. Because now they can check to make sure that I make it to the class on time, right? You know, if I'm late 10 minutes, you know, my, my, my dean will call me on the cell phone right away and say, Tech, where are you? Well, he doesn't even have to ask that question because it may be in the future, that it is mandatory that I have to install a GPS app on my phone to report my position at all times to my supervisor. <laughs> so that he doesn't even have to call me. You know, you know, it would just be a pop-up message on my phone. It's like, you're late, and this much money has now been deducted from your paycheck. <laughs> <clears throat> your benefit is now decreased to this level. Yes. Yep. Uh, along with what you were talking about, like uh, the other day we were talking about stability track and ABS and a lot of things like that. A lot of those components are already currently, like you're talking about now, mm -hmm. they're already here. So when you had to unlock the door, maybe that's your first interface, your second interface is, uh, or your, your second tag is your ID card. Mm -hmm. A lot of those physical components are already available and it's uh, on your place. persons or mm -hmm. on a vehicle. Right. It's just the software that needs to be developed. Mm -hmm. But the soft, but it is a big component because you know software. It, uh, yeah, not uh, oh, this part of the word just, but it's it, it's a matter of developing software to mm -hmm. incorporate all of those hardware components. And also, it there. can make a big difference too. You know how the software is written can make a big difference. Um, I'm not sure how many of you read consumer reports. You know, I read it just because I can look at cars that I cannot afford. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it has a lot of reviews on, you know, expensive European cars that my neighbors have, but I don't, but I don't really want it either way. Um, but the interesting part is, you know, with the expensive cars, you know, with certain brands, which I would not name, um, okay, uh, consumer reports, you know, basically say the user interface is too complicated. Um, that's the general feedback, you know, of you know luxury cars, you know, that are you know a foreign certain foreign brands of luxury cars has that you know attribute. Um, so that means you know software does have an impact on the overall appeal of a product, even though the, the product itself is a vehicle, it's a car, right? Um, but if the software doesn't work well, you know, people may or may not want to buy it anymore. I'm pretty sure that the, the thought have crossed you know, people's mind, but the liability is the issue. Actually, I think the Model S that Tesla is selling is running a version of Android. Okay. Yeah. But you uh, are they using it as? Oh, know, I, I don't right? think they're using it for like uh, the anti-lock brakes or any sort of thing. So like nothing. That. But for the actual user interface that mm -hmm. they yeah, interface. I wasn't referring to anything like the ABS or the ECU because you can program an ECU on your own. Yep. But I meant like the, the computer systems that come along with it for the. I think it is coming. I think it is coming because uh, the mechanic that I use, you know, for repairing my inexpensive cars. Um, <coughs> so you know, he himself is an in, is an interesting guy. He drives a you know like a, um, a 1.6 liter uh, diesel engine Vanagon. 
that has no, you know, it, it doesn't have enough horsepower for an air conditioner. <laughs> you know, he, when he's going on the highway at 55 miles per hour, he's flooring the gas. <laughs> okay, but you know, even he has the vision of, you know, well, you know, can we do a little flat panel dashboard? That can replace, you know, conventional mechanical, mechan mechanical slash electrical uh, dashboard. So this way, you know, people can redesign and reconfigure the dashboard any way they want. Yep. We're a motor company that currently uses Microsoft for their flat panel interface mm -hmm. uh, as far as um, instrument clusters. And there are several settings that they allow you to choose from as far as display content things mm -hmm. like that. But I don't know as far as. Uh, Microsoft's working on sync applications where it is an open interface. It's, I mean, I think within eight months. My experience, at least, with the, the user interfaces on those cars where they have like touch screens, they're about as friendly as Garmin. Yeah. So the <laughs> early ones. Where uh, the like early you ones. <laughs> striking it as hard as you can, and it's just like, you want to go here? No. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I was say, kind of adding to the Model S thing. I know that I don't think the Model S is open. Source, but it is updated by Wi-Fi or by uh, by satellite. All the software is updated by Tesla, mm -hmm. and they uh, they let you customize it basically like an application thing for your dash for your uh, for your radio and everything else. So you can put GPS, you can customize the size of that. And well, that opens up all kinds of possibilities for hackers as well. Exactly. It's pretty hard to hack a 68 Mustang dashboard <laughs> <laughs> with only a computer. Okay, if you get a crowbar, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yep. So, but that's where things are going. Okay, this is where things are going. Um, maybe in the future there won't even be a dashboard. Okay, maybe you just you know remember. Did I talk about the uh, Google Glasses in this class or not? No. No? OK, Google Glasses. OK, got to go there. Now, I do a lot of digression like this, you know, but, I only, but only because I think it is relevant to the class. My okay. boss is lording them over me. How much are they now? That's a lot. I think they're, I think they're prohibit, prohibitively expensive you know, at this point. But it doesn't matter. Give it a few years, and you know, the, the price will come down. Um, to show you what it does. Okay, so here's the uh, the current revision of Google Glasses. Uh, it looks, you know, it, it's a kind of cool looking, you know, glasses. But what it is is um, it has, I think, camera on this side. You can see this little, you know, old aperture here. You know, that's the a small camera. Um, it also has a projector. You know, there's a prism here, and so you can actually see um, a display overlay you know, <laughs> on top of what you can actually see exactly. So when that's turned <coughs> off, you just see whatever you should be seeing. But you can also overlay that with you know a projection from inside the plain part of Google Glasses. Uh, the battery is built in. Uh, the wireless technology is all built in. So this is self-contained. It's not like you have to tether this to another device in your backpack. This is all self-contained. Okay. So uh, it, al it allows two-way communication. Okay. It, it allows you to take. Uh, videos, you know, and also have the sound of whatever you are seeing and whatever you're hearing. But it can also superimpose images, you know, from the display unit um, at the same time. Okay. The reason why I mentioned this, you know, since we were talking about dashboards, is if everybody has access to something like this, especially when if they have overlaid, you know, on both eyes, you don't need a dashboard because you know all of that stuff can be overlaid, you know, right there. And it's not even, you know, so your, uh, like, the current speed doesn't have to be on the dashboard here. It can be actually, you know, right at your eye level. Mm -hmm. Now, what if you tilt your eye and, you know, move up and down and whatnot? An, accelerar an accelerometer can easily fix that, okay? So the display will stay constant at a certain part of your visual field. Um, you can also think of the implication in terms of GPS, navigation. You don't have to look at here and go, oh, am I supposed to make the next turn? You know, am I supposed to turn yet? And so on. Because you can see the arrow superimposed on the road itself to indicate, yes, you're supposed to make a left turn at the next intersection. So the possibilities are infinite. Well, I wouldn't say infinite, but it's definitely a lot of possibilities. 
Now, if you imagine that the other side is just like this side here with a super imposed in the window and also a camera, with two cameras and enough you know, software uh, intelligence, you have stereo vision. Now, when Google Glasses has you know, stereo vision, then even more possibilities open up. Because you know, when you do a gesture, like something like this, you know, ahead of you, and the camera can see it, the camera can interpret your gesture. And that becomes you know, another way to interface with a computer, is through you know, gesture. Okay? It, can, it can also you know, super, you know, superimpose a keyboard under your hand, but because the cameras can track the positions of all of your fingers, you can now type on a virtual keyboard and you can actually see the keys because it is superimposed through the glasses. Okay, so we are talking about, you know, this is not science fiction. This is stuff that we can do. It's just expensive. Yeah. So with those glasses, that's kind of like borderline holographic technology where it can like back to project it on the screen. It is, well, I'm not sure whether you would call it holographic. Because you know, with two, you know, this is not holographic yet because you know the other eye you know, doesn't have a as an overlay. But if you have both eyes you know, having overlay, then you can display three D images, right? Yeah. How much are they? Um, I think it's what fifteen hundred bucks uh, or something. Right now, uh, it's only available for developers mm -hmm. and other people who know the developers. It's fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. But I think they roughly estimated the market price when they released about five hundred, I think, to seven hundred. And that would drop to seventy five dollars, you know, real quick. Just okay. If most of you are way too young to remember, you know, laser printers when they first came out. It's the size of a small refrigerator costing about two or three thousand dollars back then. Okay? So it's equivalent to like five thousand dollars today and it's the size of a small refrigerator. You go to Fry's right now, how much do you pay for a laser printer? Fifteen bucks. Fifteen bucks. <laughs> it's insanely, you know, inexpensive. Okay? And this is what technology will do. I mean initially, you know, it may be expensive, you know. Um, but over time, you know, they will refine the manufacturing, you know, process. They will refine the technology itself, and also, don't forget, when the market is large enough, mass production will also lower the cost of just about anything that we manufacture. Okay, so you can anticipate something like this improved, much improved, in the next ten years. I'll just give it up to about ten years at the most, to be down to the level of you know thirty, forty bucks. That's going to happen, okay? And when that happens, what, does, what will it do in terms of opportunities for developers and software engineers? It's just, you know, it just <laughs> expands, right? And Wi-Fi technology will also evolve. You know, 3G, 4G, you know, the wireless communication technology will evolve as well. So maybe right now we cannot really superimpose, you know, video, you know, that is live because there's not enough bandwidth to send you know information that quickly, but you know what? Over time, it'll be reality. I was gonna say, in the future, in your home, you probably have uh, like a dishwasher that you could start with something like that, or opening your garage door, or all yeah, kinds of stuff. stuff like that. Sure, mm -hmm. but I'm saying the cost, you know, you in the future, like everybody's going to where that's interactive. <laughs> yep. Or know what you need to shop for. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Have your shopping list. Yeah. You can check Tell if it's in your it. kitchen. Yeah. And also, what what happens when you take classes? What happens to classes? And so many teachers don't want their classes recorded. I don't understand why, you know, because I, you know, if I say something in class, you know, I say it because I think it is okay and appropriate to say it. So it, in having it recorded is okay. Is that something new about like teachers not wanting their professors not wanting their uh, classes recorded? Because I hadn't heard it before, and then this semester, two of them, my calculus professor and um, my visual basic professor, both said, like, you know, you can't record my class. Some just don't like it. But I, I've had my calculus professor. Yeah, most of them don't care. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one question that you know comes to my mind is. Show up and they say, "Don't record us." Are they going to you know, take all of everybody's glasses? 
<laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. You know, back there. Well, you mentioned what happened with classes. Well, you said that in, you know, after 10 years or so, they're going to be much more improved. So you're not going to see that big camera or that projector right in front of you. Yeah. So I don't think you can even test students the same way that you will now. That's right. That is absolutely right. Yep. Um, I was thinking when you said that it records video, like just with the Boston bombing, where they only had like two good photos of the suspects, whereas if they were all wearing glasses, they'd have like five million images of yep. everything. Not that there's a bombing every day, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also, yep. You're talking about how it can be range of motion too when you get a camera on both sides. But if you put a retina scanner, you wouldn't even need that because it could just walk through your eyes are going and you can just move your eyes and basically click on applications or whatever you want. Type like it's In a way, you know, but you know, the way we look at things or the way we focus is not really just the retina because we have the ability of not moving our eye and still be able to shift where we focus on, you know, uh, in, in a certain part of our retina. Right. So you know you can you can do some rough um, you know focusing or rough you know pointing you know based on the you know, the, the orientation of the retina or the, the pupil pupils um, but you to do some really fine control you know you still need to have like you know uh, dexterity to do it uh, to do the fine control but for anything that's general like general direction where you're looking you know, yes. You can use uh, the, the position or the orientation of your pupils to do it. All right. Yep. Go ahead. Well, plus Obama's going to know what we're all doing at all times. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, th that will evolve too. As 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 sad as it is, you know. But I think people who <coughs> you know who are going to commit crime and do bad things, they will also use you know technology for their purposes too. So you know, this is going to be a, a you know. Um, cat and mouse game, you know, forever, you know, because, you know, they will both elevate you know, and make use of technology. I think that goes both ways, though, because it's, like, you know, it's the whole, if you have nothing to hide mm -hmm. idea, you know, it's still an invasion of privacy, that yes. especially with the bombing thing, mm -hmm. you know, these people aren't necessarily going to want to volunteer what they were looking at all day, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, down with that. Um, <laughs> You know, so it comes up to how how it's collected. It's just like ordinary citizens are going to be watched at what they're doing, and then it's just not exactly. Well, society will you know will change as well. You know, <coughs> culture will change. You know, because of technology. Yep. Um. Well, there's the whole thing where uh, somebody at AT and T told me that he can't see them, but like the actual high up in the company, every picture and video. So oh, yeah. If you're wearing Google Glasses when you're going to the bathroom, for an easy example, like, yeah. you know, then whatever, you know, service that the Google Glasses eventually get thrown into, whether it's an at t or Comcast or whatever, then... Mm -hmm. Now, just to push this, you know, one more step before we, you know, go back to our, you know, to, before <laughs> I go back on topic. I have only this to mention, you know, it's not being, being recorded. Uh, it's called... <coughs> This. It's a Japanese anime. <laughs> it's a cyberpunk. Is that right? Did yeah, I yeah, describe right? Yeah. Uh, Ghost in the Shell. Um, it's a cyberpunk um, anime from Japan. Um, I think the original air date of the movie was in the late 90s. It's really old by today's standard. But if you watch it even today, um, the concepts that they go through, the concepts that they introduce in this you know, entire movie, and also the subsequent TV series. To, there were two uh, series of uh, TV shows after that. Um, it's really quite interesting because you know, it goes beyond the step of Google Glasses. It goes to cybernetics. Okay? So it's not like you can just take it off or step on it to turn it off. It's always there because it's inside you. Okay? So the question is, uh, what happens to society when you have cybernetic implants that you cannot just flip a switch and turn it off? Um, so it's it's a good series to to watch uh, if you're interested in you know this sort of thing. You know, it's a it's a projection to the future, but I think you know this particular anime has a fairly realistic projection into the future, in my opinion. <clears throat> All right, so jobs, you know, jobs are good. 
All right, so getting back on topic. Okay, you know, this is you know, getting back to the present, and probably the next few years or so, you know, when you guys graduate um, from <coughs> universities. <coughs> All right, so the question now is, you know, when you look at a developer, how <coughs> is that different from a computer scientist? Did I go to the BL as the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Yes. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. So I encourage you guys to go there, you know, whenever you have time or whenever you feel like, okay, I want to explore my options, um, because you know it's a it's, it's a good website. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of information on that website. Um, first of all, the first part is, um, what is a who is a developer, and who is a computer scientist, and are there any differences? Well, a developer. Well, let me just not talk about that yet. And we'll just kind of focus on you know, these three roles. And I'm not even going to click on those slides. You know, I'm just going to talk about it here. Um, you guys, you, know, you can read it you know, online. Um, so let's imagine that you are building a house. I haven't gone through this analogy yet in this class. Yet. OK. So let's say you, know, you have a piece of um, uh, real estate um, along Highway 1. It's you know, facing the Pacific Ocean, really nice scenery, and it's yours. <coughs> and also, let's say that you have an infinite amount of money to go building a house, you know, you know, on that piece of land. Okay. So what do you do next? And now you have this, you know, really great piece of, you know, real estate, and you have the money to build your dream house, you know, along Highway One. Yep. Sure. Evaluate your needs. Evaluate your needs. So that's something that only you can do. Okay. You and your family, you know, can basically say, okay, you know, what do we need here? Okay, uh, we need you know. Okay, we need a place to live. Okay, how many bedrooms, bathrooms, um, um, how big of a kitchen? You know, because you know if you have someone in your house who likes to cook out outdoor, you might want to have an outdoor kitchen. So you make a laundry list of things that you want. Okay, are you going to like you know, lay out the whole house and actually draw the, the blueprint? You know, who is going to do that? Uh, Sorry. An architect, yes. An architect is a person who would basically take your input. You give a, a, an architect your laundry list. The architect would come visit the site, and then you know the architect will try to you know um, design a house that will fit your needs and your requirements and your preferences. Okay. A systems analyst is kind of like an architect in a way because you know the client will basically say, okay, I need an information system that can do this, this, and that. I want you know these features. I want the system to be secure. I want it to be reliable. I want high availability, and so on and so forth. A laundry list of these are things that I want. So a systems analyst will come up with a you know, basic design. But in the case of building a house, would you pass the blueprint from the architect you know, to a contractor right away? No. Or is there a someone else you know, who has to go through that blueprint also? Who is going to go to get the name? An engineer. Yeah, yeah. A civil engineer. Okay? A civil engineer will have to go through the blueprint because, well, the the design is all good, but it's only a design. It's basically just saying, okay, this house is going to be of this shape, this room is of this size, it's going to have two or three stories, and so on and so forth. But it doesn't even specify the material that will be used to build that house. Okay? Because an architect does not usually understand you know, material strength, uh, material you know, characteristics, and so on and so forth. That's the job of a civil engineer. A civil engineer will go through the blueprint, go to the site, do a whole lot of surveys, test you know, the soil, test you know, the strength of the rocks beneath the soil, and so on and so forth, and then go through the house design and then determine, OK, we cannot make this room like this because there's no material to do it. Or we cannot make this house like this because you know, it would not be safe. There's no way this house can be stable if we build it this way. Okay? So the engineer will have to go back and forth a little bit with the client and or the architect and say, well, we have to make some compromises. Okay? So they have to kind of you know, talk to each other. And eventually, they will come up with an actual blueprint that will specify the entire house. Now, it's not really just a rough sketch of what the house should look like. It is a very detailed specification. Where are the electrical outlets? Where are the faucets? You know, how do we route the uh, wiring for you know, networking? How do we route the electrical wiring? Um, 
where the fire um, hydrant, uh, not fire hydrant, but the extinguishers. Um, should this door swing open this way or the other way? Okay. How big are the windows? Are they sliding this way or do they, do they swing out? Every little detail will be included in the blueprint. And then what do you do with the blueprint? Start building. You can start building it. So who's going to do it? Sorry? A contractor. Yep, exactly. A contractor will then take the blueprint and build it step by step, foundation, and so on and so forth. Okay? So here comes a question for you. Do you think it is okay for the contractor to go through the blueprint and say, oh, I think we can fit a bigger window here? <laughs> Besides, I placed the wrong order and got a bigger window, so I'm going to just stick it here. Would that be okay? No. The same thing applies here. The same thing applies here. The systems analysts will basically come up with a blueprint or what we call a systems specification for the entire information system. So it has very, you know, it can be kind of vague and general, but most of the time it's quite specific. The developers do not have the flexibility to say, ah, I don't think it should be done this way. You know, I have a better way to do it. Okay. Now, the developer does have certain degrees of freedom because they can choose how to implement the, the process to implement the system is still the freedom of the developers. But the end product, the specification of the end product is not. In other words, the blueprint doesn't say that the contractors have to use a particular brand and a particular model of electric drills. Okay, so if the contractor wants to use a DeWalt, that's fine. If the contractor wants to use you know, another brand, you know, that's fine too. And it's the same thing here. So it's the end result that is important, but not the process to finish the product. That's what a developer does. When a contractor, when the contractors are done with building your house, then what do you do? You probably want to double check that everything is done to specification, right? So the first thing that most people think come in mind is, well, we'll just have the developers to double check the system. Because you know what? After all, they are the one who built it, and they should know it, you know, as, the, you know, as, the, you know, as well as the back of the hands and be able to check everything. They'll tend to have layers. Exactly. exactly. Even if the contractors are 100% trustworthy or the developers are 100% trustworthy, they're not trying to deceive you in any way, if they forgot about something when they're implementing, what makes you think that they will remember it when they're testing it? Do you see what I mean? Okay. So this has nothing to do with you know people being deceptive or or that kind of thing, it has to do with blind spots. Okay? If they had the blind spots during implementation, they will have the same blind spots when they're testing it. And that's why the people who come in to test an information system is another team. It's not the people who wrote the programs. It will be another team, you know, and their only job is to test a system against the specifications. Okay? Um, so that's typical of you know, what you would do with an information system. Uh, the test engineers, in this case, will be equivalent to ins in house inspectors in the case of building a house. Okay. Permit inspectors, and also if you have an expensive house that you just built, you may want to hire your own inspectors just to make sure that they don't miss anything. Because the, um, the permit instructors are only interested in permit-specific stuff. Okay. So as long as you know, everything is done you know, to what the permit allows, and also to code, they don't really care whether you know the window is too small, too big, swinging or sliding, right? But you might want to hire your own, you know, house inspector to go through the entire house inch by inch and see whether everything is done to specification. And that's the soft uh, the, that that would be the testing or the test team of an information system. Do you see computer scientists anywhere here, nope. other than the title? Nope, <coughs> because you don't need a computer scientist. A computer scientist would be the person who is inventing new building materials or new tools to build a house. Okay. That would be a computer scientist. So is that okay? I mean, do you guys kind of get a picture of you know, the different roles you know, that are related in the ICT, um, uh, information and computer technology? 
right. <clears throat> so I'm going to skip the next few slides, you know, because I just, you know, basically talked about the whole thing. And I'll skip mm. all the way to talk about algorithm. An algorithm is a fancy word. Um, it really, you know, it's, it's great to use this word in movies and, and you know, science fiction shows because it's just a cool word to use, okay? But what does it mean exactly? What is an algorithm? Well, let's go ahead and you know, do one thing here. I'm going to use you know, Google and just look it up. So we'll just say define algorithm. And Google has the definition of a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem solving operations, especially by a computer. In other words, it's, it's really just a um, very clear Okay, it's a method to do something, but in a very clear and non-ambiguous way. Okay. Step one, do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. Oh, by the way, you know, if this condition is true, you might want to go back. You have to go back to step two. So you know, that's an algorithm. Whenever you buy something that requires assembly, especially when it's kind of complicated, it's an algorithm. It really is. It's just you know simple, and it's not it's not a computer who's running the algorithm. It will be you running the algorithm to construct whatever you're constructing. Um, when people work on cars, okay, uh, the car comes in and it has a certain type of problem. The diagnosis process is an algorithm, okay, because you know to mechanics, you know there are clear steps that they have to take in order to find out what is the problem. From the you know, apparent symptom, they have they can they have to take it step by step in order to narrow down to the component that is actually at fault. Okay. And that's why you know um, Snap-on you know, makes tools that are computerized because they can, if they can express the steps you know in very clear in a very clear way on a piece of paper, they can translate that into software. And these days with OD, ODB2 and more you know, sensors on board inside the engine block the computer can actually go through those steps and be able to diagnose and say, okay, we can now narrow down the problem to here. <clears throat> so that's you know, basically what algorithm is. <clears throat> now, an algorithm is not, quote unquote, a method in a way because it's not that general. Um, an algorithm has to be precise, which means it is not ambiguous. <coughs> The steps inside an algorithm cannot have more than one way of interpretation. You give the same algorithm to two people, those two people have to be able to do exactly the same thing. It's not possible that one person will go and say, well, the way I interpret this is this. And then the other person says, well, the way I interpret this is that. Okay? That should not be possible with an algorithm. An algorithm is also specific because it only solves a particular problem. It is not a general problem-solving you know, approach. It is specific. It solves a single problem, or it gets one single task finished. Yep. So we have algorithms for solving Rubik's Cubes? Move. Solving Rubik's Cubes? They yes, they do. Mm -hmm. They have an algorithm for that. They have an algorithm for sorting. Okay, so if you have a deck of cards that is scrambled, um, there's a certain algorithm to sort it back into order. Uh, but those are all very specific problems to solve. You know, they have a very specific um, goal to ac accomplish. Um, studying hard is not an algorithm. <laughs> or, or you know, getting a good grade out of a, a class is not an algorithm because it doesn't describe how to do it. Okay. What about that? What about the order of operations? The order, okay, an algorithm is a specification of uh, operations, and then the sequencing of the operations is important inside the specification of an algorithm. And most universities, I'm reading the last paragraph here, most universities have an upper division class called algorithm analysis or the analysis of algorithms. It's usually one or the other. That class is basically a math class that analyzes algorithms for all sorts of stuff. The first thing they analyze an algorithm for is the correctness, okay? Does it solve the problem, okay? Two, how efficient is it, okay? If you compare this algorithm to solve the problem, you 
and they compare the another algorithm to solve exactly the same problem, how do they compare? Is one always going to be faster than the other one? Okay. So that's what that class is about. It's called the algorithm uh, analysis of algorithm or algorithm analysis. In this class, we do not use an actual code. You know, we don't use actual C code or C++ or Java or Python or Pro or PHP. We use pseudocode in this class, uh, which means it cannot be run by a computer. Okay, it's not the intent to run the algorithms through a computer in this class. You guys will be running the algorithms, okay? Because I want to make sure that everyone in this class can understand the operations before you specify those operations in other classes to be run by a computer. Okay, so that's why we use pseudocode here. Um, pseudocode also has other advantages. You know, I'm not, I'm not exactly reading from the notes here, but pseudocode has other advantages too. When you get into C++ and Java and other you know language specific classes, you have to learn the syntax of the programming language. The syntax is basically the grammar of a programming language, except there's one difference, okay? If I use the wrong grammar in my class, for the most part, you can still understand what I'm talking about because there's, there's a lot of redundancy, okay? If I say, um, on Tuesday, I talk about blah, 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 the wrong tense, okay? You guys might spot that I used the wrong tense. I should have said, you know, on Tuesday, I talked about blah, blah, blah. But that's not going to you know, stop you from understanding what I actually want to talk about, right? Um, when you write a program in a specific programming language, if you miss a colon, if you use a comma instead of a semicolon, okay, it's going to break. In Python, if you use the wrong indentation, one too many space before something, it's not going to work. Okay. And that's partially also another reason why I don't want to use a particular programming language and use pseudocode, because I want you guys to focus on the concepts of programming, but not so much the, me the mechanical stuff of programming. Okay, so I don't want the syntax to get in the way of understanding the operations. Are there any questions? I think I missed something that I really should have mentioned, so I'm going to go back just a little bit, go back to developers. And I want to focus on this part here. Several ch major challenges in program development. In other words, um, these are things that are, that can be a showstopper for some people. Some people cannot you know, pursue a career <coughs> in computer science because of this. Okay? So I just want to go through this here very briefly. We have another eight minutes or so, seven minutes or so in this class. So we'll just use that time for this. Maybe we'll have some spare time. Um, the first part, as I said, you know, is the grammar of a programming language. That means you, you know, somebody actually has to be very specific and actually know, oh, I need to have a semicolon here, or I need to have, you know, I need to use round parentheses instead of square brackets. Um, it, this is not too bad of a problem. If you use it enough, it's just a matter of time before you get used to the syntax of a particular programming language. But some people, cannot deal with you know this sort of thing. <clears throat> the second one is a little bit harder because it's not about memorization or just getting used to something. It's programming logic. A systems analyst, SA is a systems analyst, works with high level logic that can be represented by diagrams. So you can draw a picture, you can draw a flow chart, a state diagram, and people can look at that diagram e and easily understand the logic of something. Okay? That's, you know, that works for a systems analyst. But at a program level, a developer needs to pay close attention to details, and lots and lots of them. Okay? And that means you know, when you are writing programs, a lot of times you need to be very focused. Okay? You cannot have distractions. You, know, you need to be really focused on your programs. <clears throat> and this often, you know, the next sentence says, you know, this often con con conflicts with other duties of a systems analyst because a systems analyst has to you know, answer calls and you know, call people, go to meetings and stuff like that. And all of that stuff is not good when you are writing programs because when you're writing programs, you basically need hours of, you know, you know, of concentration on just the 
program itself. You know, you don't want to be, you don't have, you don't want to answer <coughs> phone calls or you know talk to people, you know, while you're doing writing your programs because you it requires that much uh, concentration to get the programs done. And I can I can see some people saying, you know, but you know, I know people with ADD or ADHD, and they are still successful, you know, programmers or developers. Well, guess what? ADHD has nothing to do with the ability to concentrate or focus. In fact, I would even venture to say that you know, many really, really successful programmers that I know, you know, have ADHD. It's, ADHD simply means that you know, those people cannot, they can get distracted easily when, they don't, they're, when they're not doing something that they like to do. <laughs> okay? That's the conditional part of ADHD. Okay, they can get distracted, but only when they're not doing something that they want to do. When they're doing something they want to do, you cannot peel them off. <laughs> okay, whereas people without AD, without ADHD, you can just say, "Oh, it's five o'clock. Okay, I'm going home." With ADHD, those people will go, "No, I'm still writing my program. Don't bug me. Go away." <laughs> So I just wanted to make sure that people understand, you know, it's when I say, you know, focus and concentration, <coughs> it doesn't mean that, you know, people with ADHD or other conditions cannot do it. Okay? It's really not the case. Um, in fact, if you look at the typical stereotype of a programmer, a lot of times you know, they work over time. It's five o'clock, they're not going home. Because it's really not easy to stop. If you stop at 5 p.m. and you're halfway through writing a, sub, a subroutine or something like that, the next day you will need about half an hour to an hour just to get back to the same point where you left off the day before. At least that's my personal you know, experience. Okay? So that's why you know, when, they keep, when they are going, you know, especially when things are working, they want to keep going until it's 10 a.m., you know, 10 p.m., and then, you know, and then there's sunlight outside again, and you go like, oh no, it's another day again, <laughs> already. <clears throat> All right, so that's really you know, one of the many <coughs> requirements of being a successful developer, which is also a prerequisite to become a good so computer scientist, okay? Because you gotta be a, a good developer or have the traits of a good developer before you can become a computer scientist. The last one here is the most difficult one. Okay, it is a great attribute for a developer. It's an essential um, trait for a computer scientist. Okay, and it's called debugging. Debugging is troubleshooting, basically. It's just troubleshooting in the context of writing programs. Okay, um, <coughs> some people can do it. Some people cannot do it. Um, Diagnosing faulty programs can take up much of the work hours of a developer. In other words, a lot of times, it's not just writing new code that is taking up the time, it's actually fixing problems that is taking the time, okay? And this really differentiates you know, the quality of um, you know, employees. Because what this requires is focus, okay? We got focus in the previous one too. But this one also requires extra analytical mind, an extra extra um, analytical mind, and you know people have to stay basically collected and calm after repeated failure to locate problems. I try this, no, that's not a problem. I try this, this is not a problem. I try this, it's not a problem. I'm getting a little angry here, and I'm going to try this one here, and the next thing you know, the white mouse becomes a bat <laughs> <laughs> because it just gets airborne and. <laughs> On to the other part of the office. I'm talking about this because I saw it. <laughs> I saw it happen. I have not seen the broken monitors yet, you know, but you know, but the flying mouse, yes. I, I know engineers who would get so, you know, worked up they would just rip the mouse off and go <laughs> go off across the room. Um I haven't seen that but I, I've seen people getting pretty close to doing that. Yeah, so those people are not exactly suitable for you know, this kind of jobs. <clears throat> uh, let's continue next, Tues next uh, Tuesday, that's right. Thank you. And I'll be adding more, well, I cannot add anyone else today because you know, I need two absences to block people.
Well, we got one, two. We got two people who did not show up today. Uh, so if the same people did not show up next Tuesday, they would be dropped and then I can move two people from waiting list into the class. Gotcha. Yeah, send an email to me. I can add you to Moodle, but you won't be on the actual roster. I'm basically the manager of the extra set of hands and people just throw projects at me. Well, that's good. Uh, so they have to exceed the limit of the unit. I did petition yesterday to add okay. this class and they told me.